Hey y'all, I'm Miranda Wiley, a conference programmer for South by Southwest. Welcome to another South by Southwest session online with special guests, Bobby Burke and Clay Skipper. We're excited to have Bobby Burke, a design and lifestyle expert and host of Netflix Queer Eye, in conversation with Clay Skipper, who writes for GQ and hosts their health and wellness podcast, Airplane Mode. Bobby and Clay will discuss the power of design how design helps us live healthier and smarter lives, and how design can bring us a sense of comfort when life is out of our control. Bobby will also share some tips on how to turn even the most chaotic space into a tranquil destination. Without further ado, here is Bobby Burke and Clay Skipper. Hey guys, how you doing? I'm- hey, Good morning, uh, everybody. I'm Clay Skipper, which you figured out because I'm not Bobby Burke. Uh, but I'm thrilled to be here with Bobby. How, how are you doing, Bobby? I'm good. I'm good. You? I'm good. All things considered. Hanging in there. Um, where, where? I'm getting you from LA, right? Uh, yeah, I'm in LA. I was actually in Austin until last Friday, but I um, decided to come back to LA, see how it goes here. <laughs> and may I ask where you are in your house? Since, you know, we're talking about design, you have this lovely display behind you. I'm, uh, I'm in my home office. Okay. Yeah. Looks, looks in my nice. home office right now. I'm looking out over all the hills in LA, which are very pretty today. Nice and sunny. Great. Like As every day to LA. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so of course, as Miranda said, we're here talking about design, mental health, and, um, Obviously, those are of the utmost importance all the time, but especially in this sort of strange moment we're going through, they're of amplified importance, I think, given that we're all sort of confined to one space for an extended period of time. So I guess just to kick us off, I'd be curious to ask you how you think design impacts mental health or how design can um, influence the, the way we feel uh, inside. You know, I think that mental health has a huge, or mental health, um, I think design has a huge impact on our mental health. You know, I talk about this on Queer Eye all the time, especially when we have heroes that have been suffering from depression. You know, the surrounding yourself with chaos and mess only adds to that. And especially in a time where we are stuck at home all day and all night. Um, if we're surrounding ourselves by chaos, it's, it spills into our mind. You know, if we wake up every day and we are surrounded by all that laundry we didn't do the night before. Not only are we waking up instantly feeling like we failed, we are reminded of the things that we didn't accomplish. And then if we don't do it that day, the last thing we get before we go to bed as we look around is we're reminded again of the things we did not accomplish. And after a while, that, that starts to build up on your mind. And you know, when you don't accomplish things at work, it starts to wear on you. It's the same at home. So I always find that keeping my home clean and tidy, you know, it doesn't have to be the most well-designed place. You know, it's not about that. Um, design, you know, a well-designed place can also affect your mental health. But for me, the thing that affects it the most is the chaos and the mess and not keeping your house organized and tidy. You know, you don't have to be a crazy Virgo like me, but you know, it. you, you will find that, you know, making that bed, putting those dishes away, it will bring a sense of peace to you. You know, when, I, when I'm surrounded by that, like if I walk into the kitchen at night and there's still dishes everywhere, it gives me anxiety. And whether you really think about that or not, it, it probably does that to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I am also a Virgo. So uh, <laughs> I hear you on the, the crazy Virgo energy. Um, yeah, you mentioned, we talked yesterday, you mentioned uh, how you've been making your bed in quarantine. I think that's really interesting. So was that not a practice you had before and it's just something you started now? You know, no, it, it wasn't a practice before. I, uh, my life was it's so insane before, you know, I'd get up before it got light. I'd usually be out of the house and on set before it was even light. And then I'd come back late at night and just crawl right back into bed. So I'd often find, I didn't make my bed because the moment I got out of it, I didn't see it again until I was getting back in it. And I'm like, that's just one extra thing I don't have to do today, you know, just like, you and I, we wear black every day. Uh -huh. it's just one decision <laughs> I don't have to make. I know I'm putting on my pair of thieves t-shirt and that's what I'm wearing every day because I have about 200 of them. Um, <laughs> so the, making the bed, it was just one extra thing I, I just mentally, you know, didn't do. But now like I see that bed all day long. 
And so if I see that bet unmade, it gives me anxiety. And so now I'm like, I'm taking steps to make sure that the things that I'm surrounding myself with aren't causing extra chaos in my mind because there's plenty of chaos out in the world as it is. The real question will be is if you stick with that, uh, making the bed habit after after this all hopefully ends. You know what, honestly, I think I will because I, I've, I enjoy it. And the funny thing is like, I almost re, before I would almost remake my bed before I got in it because I also can't stand getting in a messy bed so although I wouldn't technically, I wouldn't make it in the morning, like before I could get in it, I'd still have to like pull the covers up and straighten it out. Like, cause I can't get in a messy bed. So like, <laughs> it, it's weird. I'm weird. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but I think there's something about getting into a made bed. You definitely sleep better. So I hear you yeah. on that. Um, that it's, inter it's interesting though, the, the, cause I think it's so true what you're saying about having sort of a chaotic environment can then uh, sort of foster chaos. In, uh, inside and I'm curious when you first had that realization or when or more broadly like when you knew design sort of had that um, power over our emotions and feelings you know I think it's just be from personal experience you know I've suffered from depression before and I've I've luckily enough been self-aware enough to kind of realize the things that make it worse and and realize you know when you have those days where you don't really want to get out of bed you know, the stuff that you're surrounded by can can make that feeling even worse. You know, when you wake up and you're like, uh, you're having one of those days where it's it's harder to get out of bed than normal and you look around and your room is in chaos, that cover just comes back over the head and you're like, I'm not dealing with this, you know? So I, I think it's from personal experience. And, and then, you know, with Queer Eye working with more and more individuals who it's not just about design, it's about helping them, you know, mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally. Uh, realizing the things that have helped them and and made their their path a little more positive. Huh. Uh, yeah, to that point, I'm curious. So, you know, knowing that design does have that effect, when you are working with the heroes or, you know, working with clients outside the show um, and you're designing a space for them and have their sort of mental health and their feelings in mind, like what questions are you asking them to ensure that when the space is finished, it will sort of foster that energy or that that vibe that makes them feel like them or makes them feel like what they what the, want the space to give them um when it comes to design with them you know it's often quite hard to get to know everything someone needs in you know the literally hours i have <laughs> I, if I, I wouldn't even say hours you know maybe the hour i have with them on a tuesday to kind of figure out my plan uh -huh. um luckily though like i I've learned how to use that time wisely. And I've, you're, I've learned to not really ask them about design. Um, hmm. In the beginning, you know, if you take Tom, the very first episode of Queer Eye ever, um, you know, I would ask him, you know, what's your design aesthetic? He's like, you know, modern contemporary. And I'm like, do you know what modern contemporary is? And he's like, no, I just heard it once. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. I didn't think you knew what modern contemporary was. Um, and so I've learned that to not ask them about design, but to ask them about, you know, their favorite magazine, their favorite TV show, their dream vacation, you know, their favorite sweater. Um, and that actually gives me a window into what they like. And that normally almost 100% of the time will translate into a home that they like, um, because design often scares people because they, they don't think they have a design eye, even though everyone does you may not be able to put a gallery wall together but you still have an eye for what you like you just don't always know how to translate what you like into design again because it's it's scary it's scary and overwhelming to some people so my advice is always just to start thinking about the things you like in, in other aspects of your life when i'm dealing with an actual client i usually have them put together a pinterest board but often i don't even tell them to pin design stuff it's pin your favorite travel locations pin food you know because like I can I can tell when somebody is going to like really architectural clean line stuff based on like the food they pin like how it's plated on the plate huh. you know like the stuff that you would see me plating would be very organized and very you know compartmentalized on a plate that's the way I've always been like even as a kid like things couldn't touch if my food touched I freaked out and I couldn't eat the hearts that touched um, I needed it to be very organized and like clean cut um, I loved when my mom got me the plates with like the different little compartments. Sections. Could, yeah. yeah, the different sections. I could keep my food separate. 
Um, I don't even remember the question now. <laughs> that's some that's some true Virgo energy. The uh, keeping the food separate, though, I respect that. I hear that. Um, <laughs> do you? So that's interesting, though. Because that's does that translate to other parts as well? Like basically, you know that that food idea is super interesting to me. Like, can you? Do you ever find that? like the way people dress also translates that way? And have you ever experienced someone who you you looked at them and you saw the way they like their food or they like their dress and then the fashion, or let me sorry, their design aesthetic was completely uh, off kilter based on that? Hmm, not really. Okay. I, Tan and I on Queer Eye, we always work quite closely together because I find that again, often the hero is much, it's much easier for them to kind of translate what they're looking for in fashion, at least color wise. Mm -hmm. um, and I will find out that information from him and I'll usually integrate a lot of that information into their home. Um, Cause again, they get scared when they're talking to me because they've, they've never designed a house. They have no idea. They've usually at least picked out a shirt, you know? So um, I get a lot of that information and it usually translates. A lot of times they'll be like, oh, how, how'd you figure that out? I'm like, I just, mm -hmm. I, I listened, you know, I listened <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, but we didn't even talk about design. I'm like, I know, yeah. I just, I still listen. You know, if we go back to the Remy episode of season, I forget if it was season 486 or 487, but one of the many that we've done in three years. Um, <laughs> it was Remy and he had lost his grandmother recently and inherited her house. And the house was very 70s, like grandma had style. It just, you know, wasn't up to date for a 27 year old bachelor. Um, and he had no idea what his design aesthetic was. And so I asked him about, you know, his favorite show, which was Mad Men and his dream vacation, which was to go to Cuba. So I'm like, well, Mad Men in Cuba, very 50s, you know, Cuba's stuck in the 50s, Mad Men is based in the 50s, so I went with a mid-century feel, you know, I did like a deep green of like jungle um, plants from Cuba and a Cuban mural, and he walked in and he's like, oh my god, this could, I, if I, in a million years, knew design and could articulate what it would look like, I would not have even been to, able to articulate this, huh. but this is exactly me. And he's like, how'd you, I, we didn't even talk about this. And we have a, a questionnaire that producers have them fill out about like design and it, it never makes any sense what they fill out. Like sometimes they'll be like, what's your favorite color? And they're like, every color in the rainbow. I'm like, you're not helping me, <laughs> you know? Or what's your favorite design store? And they're like, Walmart. I'm like, that's not a design store. <laughs> um, so it's, it's about listening to people about other things that make them tick. Yeah. That's how I get, that's how I get that information. So that's, yeah, because I was going to ask you what's, what are some, you know, if someone says, I have no idea about my design aesthetic or where I start. I might be one of those people. I may have, I may have moved these plants right here just to make it appear as if I had some design. Hey, but see, you're self-aware of design enough. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I got to rise up the occasion here. The funny thing is, I was looking at your plants and I was like, God, I should have put more plants. Like, I have some over here in the corner. You just can't see it. I'm like, the plants look really nice. These are 66% <laughs> of the plants I own. So <laughs> there's one, the rest of the apartments are just one lonely plant. I'm, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I was asking you, like, where would I start? But it sounds like, what are the, what's the pop culture you like? What, what's in your closet? You know, just sort of look in other areas of your life to identify. Yeah, even like your music, uh -huh. you know, look at album covers, you know, if that's the type of thing that makes you tick. You know, your home is about having things in it that, you know, as Marie would say, spark joy and mm -hmm. bring you happiness and, and make you feel relaxed and at peace. And if, you know, it's a bunch of crazy ass album covers, if that's what makes you happy, that may not be my thing, but that's your thing. And that's like, people ask me what my favorite trend is all the time. And I'm like, my trend is whatever makes you happy in your home. Cause your home, <clears throat> think of it like a phone charger. You know, if your phone charger has a short in it and your phone doesn't get a full charge that night, you're not gonna make it through the day. Mm. You're the same way with your home. When you go home at night, that home is to plug you in and to recharge you. That's your sanctuary. That's supposed to be the place where you're at peace and can really recharge. And if you don't get that good night's sleep, if you don't get fully recharged, you don't make it through the day. And eventually that just wears you down. So think of your home as that mental phone charger for yourself. 
I love that metaphor. And I feel like it's apt right now because I feel like a lot of people are feeling just from speaking to friends and, and whatnot anecdotally, I feel like I've I've learned that people are feeling really frazzled right now for good reason. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious if you have, I mean, obviously what I'm hearing you say is that design is very individual, um, but I'm curious just generally if you have any tips to sort of, you know, if someone's feeling like their space right now is particularly stale, uh, either because like me, they haven't designed before or because they've been there for 60 days now and want to switch it up. What are some easy sort of DIY things you can you can institute to, to maybe spruce it up or uh, en enliven it a little bit? You know, a lot of times people always think <clears throat> in design to spruce it up, you need to add, add stuff, uh -huh. add to the room. It's not always the case. A lot of times making your space feel better is about taking stuff away. You know, especially when you've been in a place for a few years, you accumulate things that you don't need, you don't want, you thought it was a good idea at the time, but now it's useless or you, you know, even if it's not decor stuff, it's just stuff that have ended up stacked around that you thought you'd use and you never did. Get rid of stuff, you know, donate stuff, organize it, you know, make things, you know, take one thing away as Coco Chanel would say. Um, and if you've already done that, move stuff around, you know, take the art that's in your bedroom, move it to the living room, you know, move furniture around. I've always found back in the day when I didn't have the money to buy new things, I would just move stuff from room to room. And I would change things around and it would feel like a fresh apartment just by moving stuff from different rooms. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting. I switched my bed and my desk at the very be beginning of isolation. And it's it feels like a whole different vibe in there, even though nothing yeah. came out and nothing went in. It just like totally changes the energy. Yeah, just move. I used to move my bedroom around all the time as a little kid. I loved changing my bedroom around. Yeah. And have you switched anything like that? in sort of the time you I know you've only been in LA for a little while now but I'm just curious if you've switched anything around like that uh no not at all I've only been home for a week I've been redoing the deck and the fencing around my house okay <laughs> but that's about it yeah. <laughs> uh do you, you know you mentioned your uh home office there and mm -hmm. um another thing I've been noticing in this time is like I'm working from home now and there's no boundary between working and not working um you know there's there's the commute um which is obviously gone and for people who are in smaller apartments even there may be no physical separation between where they work and where they hang out and where they sleep um i've seen some people say that like as much as you can you should try to have one space be for one use so you should work where you work and you should read where you read you should watch tv where you watch tv I'm just curious how much credence you give to that sort of philosophy or thinking or. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that. You know, we need that separation of space because if not, you kind of feel like you're always working. Mm -hmm. You know, if your home becomes that workspace, you, you never really feel like you've left work. You'll still, you know, even though we did before, always check those emails and respond to those emails late at night. I think right now we really shouldn't. You know, even if you're in a studio apartment, get a bed tray. You know, and if you're working on your bed, when that tray is on your bed and your laptop is on it, you're working at five, six or in New York, 9 p.m. When you're done working, you know, you take that tray off, you put it under your bed. When that tray is away, you're not working. You know, you really need to separate that space, even if it's still the same physical space, you know, putting a bed tray down there that has your glass of water and your laptop, you know, that's work time. When it's gone, it's not, um, you know, whether that be a, your coffee table, your dining table, you know, when you're at that space, you're working. When you're not at that space, you're at home. Because the last thing we want to do is burn ourselves out at home to where when this is all over, when we're even when we're at home, it's not a space of relaxation and recharging anymore. It just it feels like work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I I'm curious how you, you know, you mentioned at the very beginning of this a couple minutes ago how you used to be up before dawn and you'd be you wouldn't make the bed and you'd be on set. Um and now we're obviously all at home. And like, I think another tricky thorny subject for a lot of people is productivity, right? Like mm -hmm. how much should we be thinking about how often we should be working and how much we should be getting done? Um, I'm curious how that, A, how you're thinking about productivity right now and how that, you know, you mentioned sort of turning off at night. So I'm curious how you're thinking about productivity, how you're sort of approaching that and how that transition to this, this new way of thinking has, has been for you. It's productivity has been very odd for me because my life is so different than it normally was. Um, you know, right now, the majority of work for me is, is filming. 
you know, whether it be Queer Eye or, or other shows I'm working on, and all that is completely on hold. So there is zero to do with those. Um, but it's, you know, to keep myself productive, we've been doing other things like these sessions, you know, I've been doing a lot of content for magazines and for online. Um, on my design business, unfortunately, like because of the stay home orders, like all that's on pause. So there really hasn't been a lot of design stuff for me to do either. Um, so it's it's been sometimes hard and it, you know, can cause a bit of depression when I'm like, I don't have anything to do. I can't read another book. I can't you know, watch one more show. Um, so that's why like, I love things like this, you know, it kind of forces me to, to prepare for things and, and get up and, you know, put on a hat instead of doing my hair. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, staying productive. I, I almost wish I had more to do, you know, um, I've, I've been coming up with new projects and, and writing new scripts and things like that. So I've, I've definitely been keeping productive, but I, I, I almost envy those people that still have kind of that nine to five job of, okay, I, I have this, 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 and this to accomplish. Like it is a set goal instead of me, like right now, I'm kind of like, hmm, what could I come up with that I need to accomplish? You know, it's added a whole nother layer to it. Um, I wish I just had like every day, I'm like, all right, here's my workload for the day. And I could do that since I'm, a, you know, again, as a Virgo, like that's the way my mind thinks. Um, so yeah, it's been interesting with productivity for me because I'm not, again, I'm not only having to be productive, I'm having to think of ways and make up things to then force myself to be productive on. Have you been good about when you do need to work being in your office and sort of sticking that one space, one use or how how's that been? Um, no, because most of my work is not office work. Yeah, yeah It's sense. not a lot of emails, like when I'm, you know, creating content, it's all over the house, you know, with different design stuff. It's also, you know, wherever the best lighting is during that part of the day, um, you know, making sure that the backgrounds look different for all the videos I'm doing. So with my work, it's, I'm not necessarily able to do that, but when I am doing like office work and I'm responding to emails, when I'm going through contracts, I do make sure that I'm always here in this space doing that. Mm. Or, you know, I was in an Airbnb in Austin over in Boulder Creek, and I was lucky enough that, the, it, they had a home office as well. And I would make sure that any Zoom call I took was in that office. And same here, any Zoom call I'm taking is in here. This is kind of like my conference room. And I, I don't have conference calls or Zoom meetings anywhere else other than here. Huh. Yeah. And you mentioned trying to figure out the workload every day. I'm curious um, if you found a routine or just in general, something that's that's helped you to protect your own mental health at this time. Because I think, you know, it's something that we're all being taxed it's all of our mental health are being taxed a little bit so i'm curious if, if you fitness think. honestly is what i found especially since again i don't have that monday through friday job i don't have mm -hmm. that nine to five job my work even working from home there there is no schedule um so i found that fitness is the way i've like kept a schedule um monday wednesday friday my trainer zach and i who we've been quarantined together this whole time he was working with he travels with anthony and i when we're filming so he was in often with us um, you know, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we do a live workout. And then also every day we do a morning workout and an evening workout. And so those are like two set schedule things every single day, seven days a week that kind of keep me in check. Otherwise, especially in Austin, they had the best blackout shades and I could lay in bed until 11 in the morning. You know, here our bedrooms on the east side and I purposely only got solar shades so at 6 30 that sun comes up and starts shining right in your face even through the solar shades it makes me get up but yeah and often i could lay in bed all day <laughs> yeah it's uh I, I may have peeped on your instagram that you did an upper body workout yesterday with with backpacks filled with weight yeah yeah it was great what'd you put in that backpack uh i'll never tell no, I think I have. <laughs> A couple of books and whatever random crap was already in it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, another thing I want to ask you about is if you are, um, you know, I might be projecting my own experience again here, but let's say you are uh, isolating or now in quarantine with a, new, a relatively new partner or you and your partner have been dating for a while, but now you're together here and you have very different design aesthetics. Uh, 
how would you address or advise navigating that particular complication right now? Um, my husband and I have been together for 16 years. Okay. So he, he had no design aesthetic when I met him. He has opinions now, but luckily he doesn't realize it, but they're just my opinions. Cause you know, I've molded him into <laughs> what I wanted him in design over the years. So we, we rarely have uh, any, I mean, we rarely have arguments, but we definitely don't over design stuff. Um, but I, I would say, you know, whoever has the best taste wins. <laughs> Um, a couple years ago, I was speaking in Denver and I had a young lady at the end ask a question. And she was like, you know, I'm, I'm dating this guy and we're in love and I think I want to get married. But, you know, one of the things that really just frustrates me and annoys me and makes me question it is the fact that he has zero design sense. Like his apartment has no decor. It's, it's like a black leather sofa and a torch lamp. He like doesn't care about design at all. And it's really, really important to me. You know, what should I do? And I'm like marry him if this is something that's super important to you and you want to be designing and he doesn't care what you do that's a huge plus so many couples you know especially when they first move in with each other go through it because they both have opinions of how they want the house to look and feel if he's gonna let you do whatever you want that's great marry him i love that <laughs> yeah um my partner would definitely say she has better design taste than i do so i guess i need to seed control here a little bit <laughs> you know it's definitely always great to you know ask the opinions you know because mm -hmm. usually usually in a relationship there's one of the people like doing the home more than the other you know mm -hmm. occasionally you'll get a couple that they both really enjoy it but usually you know opposites attract you know and one person is going to be into making the home look nice more than the other person will but it's still always great to have their opinions like with my husband now that he has opinions on design when we're doing the house I'll usually lay out a few different mood boards mm -hmm. they're all my choices <laughs> uh, all three of them are my choices I want all three of them but I allow him to make a choice of which one of the three that I chose that he likes, you know? So it's it's good to include them and, you know, make sure that it, it feels like their home as well. I think that's always the thing that spouses want the most is they want it to feel like it's, it's their home too. Um, so just include them, even if, you know, give them three choices, they're all three or still your choices, but give them choices and they'll feel included and it will greatly reduce the amount of fights and hurt feelings. You know, don't always tell them like, oh, these are three, my three choices and no matter what you choose, because they're all three good because I picked them. Just be like, what do you think of these three things? What about these three sofas? Yeah. It's a master negotiation tactic right there. Yep. Hey, I always wanted to be a lawyer. That was my dream when I was little. Oh, I think the uh, the interior design is working out okay. I think so. <laughs> um, to bring it back a little bit to mental health and design, I'm curious because I I've seen you say like I you guys keep in touch with the heroes after the shows sometimes. Right? A lot of them, yeah. Sometimes yeah. a few no, but a lot of them, yeah, we do. And I'm curious what sort of feedback you've gotten from them um, about how the design helped change their life or helped push them in a new direction or sort of did did tweak their their um, their mental health in a way. Uh, I mean, especially ones who had had fought with depression, um, and those were conversations that we had. Like, if you think of Neil Reddy, I think he was episode two of season one, um, Saving Sasquatch, Indian guy with the huge beard. Um, he's actually become a close friend of mine throughout the years, and his home was one that he never really put much into, and it was always kind of a mess, and, you know, covered in dog hair, and it affected his mental health, and he didn't even think of it. And, you know, the conversations we've had since then, he's like, you know what? I've noticed that it's much easier to get out of bed when you're not getting out of bed in a room that's in complete and utter chaos. And you feel much better going to bed at night when you get into a bed that's nice and neat and your room around you is neat. He's like, I, I've absolutely 100% seen how it can affect that. Hmm. Um, and, and even just the way things operate with the way, you know, it's not just about cleanliness, it's about the way things flow. You know, when you have a family that every morning always gets into arguments because that kitchen just doesn't flow well. You're right on top of each other. And, you know, me going in and like reconfiguring a kitchen and giving a family a kitchen island when they didn't have one before. They're like, 
our mornings don't end up in arguments because we're not on top of each other. We're not fighting for space. And it's, it's really affected the way our family communicates with each other. And, the, and it's really enhanced the time that we get to spend, you know, the little bit of time in the morning at breakfast and the little bit of time at evening at dinner, it's made it a much more pleasurable experience because there's not that strife that our space was causing, you know, we thought it was each other, but it was actually just the fact that we didn't have our own space and we were just annoying each other and that translated into constant fights. So it's, yeah, there's many different ways it can affect whether it's spatially or, you know, organizationally. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It makes the, like the, the line between design and sort of how you're feeling and emotions very, very clear. Yeah. Um, last question I'll ask before we get to the q and I, I, I didn't mention this before because I want to put you on the spot a little bit, but I'm curious if someone said you're going to have to spend the next two months, 60 days or whatever in the same place, which of your castmates would you have wanted to design that space? Anthony. Okay. Yeah. Anthony has a really good eye for design. Okay. Really good eye for design. Uh, we always say like, we always have a conversation like on the very last episode of Queer Eye, whenever that happens, we should all do like a switcheroo. Um, and Anthony and I are always like, we'll switch. Like I, I love to cook. He loves to design. Yeah. It's, it's funny in the beginning, before the show came out, we'd meet people and they'd always try to guess what category each one of us was in and everyone always chose tan as hair and grooming just because he is so impeccably groomed and his <laughs> hair is always so perfect and they always chose karamo for fashion because he is so fashionable they always thought um jonathan was the chef they thought anthony was culture usually people actually got me as design or food yeah huh. Well, yeah, just, yeah, they yeah. definitely always chose Karamo and Tan for grooming and Karamo for fashion every <laughs> single time. No one ever got that right. <laughs> I assume Anthony knows that if he switches with you, he essentially has to build a house in 48 hours, right? Uh, yeah, he's, he's been <laughs> around. He gets it. <laughs> but yeah, no, his, um, his apartments are always beautiful. Him yeah. and I bonded the most in the beginning just because he has... Um, Ted Allen, who he used to work for, or his protege from the original Queer for the Straight Guy, his husband owns a beautiful vintage furniture store in mm. Brooklyn, which Anthony would spend a lot of time at. And I was always shocked when we'd like walk through a space and Anthony would be like, oh, that's a blah, blah, blah chair from blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't even know that. How the hell do you know that? And he's like, <laughs> it's just information I picked up. He's like an a, a encyclopedia. But then, wow. then I realized it's information he picked up because he was at Ted's husband's store a lot and they have the most beautiful vintage furniture huh. but yeah Anthony has impeccable taste okay they all, all right. do don't get me wrong they all do yeah but yeah. Anthony's taste is very in line with mine personally okay well good yeah. to know um cool I, we've got some questions here from the audience um the first question is what is your favorite element or principle of design to use when designing a space my favorite element of design? I wonder what they mean. My favorite element of design. Um, I would probably say art. Art completely changes a room um, okay. for the good or for the bad. Um, art can be very soothing. Art can make you happy, you know? Yeah, I think art is one of the most important things in a room. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be expensive art. It can, you know, for design projects, I get, tons of art from Etsy. Um, huh. There's so many amazing artists that you can download their art digitally. Um, you, you know, it doesn't even have to be shipped to you. And the great companies like Framebridge, you download the art from Etsy digitally and you go to Framebridge and you upload it into their system and pick the frame and it shows up framed. And it's, it's not that expensive. Often you can get downloads on Etsy for like 49 cents. You know, I, I don't think I've ever paid more than $10 for a digital download on Etsy and it's unique, it's cool. Um, and then you can get it framed for really cheap as well. So art and just digital downloads. Wow, yeah. that's a great tip. Yeah, because I feel like art is such a high barrier to entry and so many people don't yeah. know where to start. And that's, that's yeah. great. Um, another question, what is, your, what is your best tip for staying organized at home? My best tip for staying organized at home? Um, 
using little using containers and compartments like everything needs to have a space and everything needs to always go back in that space um even if you're using reusing like amazon boxes mm -hmm. you know cut the the lids off or keep the lids on so you can stack them labeling things you know labeling even if you're not using a label maker even if you're just using a marker to write on the boxes making sure that every single thing has its place will help you stay organized because once it has its place when you use it it will go back there and it's much easier to keep things organized and know where they are and because when you don't know when something is to find it you end up pulling everything else out and then you create chaos with that and then once you find that thing and you use it you're so annoyed you don't want to put everything back and so that drawer just becomes cut, utter chaos again. So if you, even if it's in a drawer, if you have little boxes stacked in there with what's in it, you know, on the top, you know, labeling and compartmentalizing things is super important in organizing because you don't have to go through everything else to find that one thing and you don't have to rip through it all and destroy it all and then use the energy to put it all back together. You know, you go right to that one spot. Huh. Sustainable too, if you're using Amazon boxes. That's a great, exactly. that's a good one. Yeah. Where'd you pick that up? Uh, from all the Amazon boxes, I guess. And <laughs> since being like, I can reuse this. Exactly. Yeah. I just, every time I get packaging, it, it makes me sad because I, I try yeah. to be as environmentally friendly as possible. So I, I try to reuse things as much as possible. That's great. Yeah. Um, question here from a fan of the show. Uh, I imagine we have many of those in the, in the audience. I noticed that you favor dark paint colors a lot when designing on Queer Eye. How do you balance that so that it doesn't feel overwhelming? Um, I use light furniture. If you notice, I never use everything dark and I never use everything light. Like, um, in my house, I actually don't have one dark wall. Every single wall in my entire house is bright white, which people are always shocked when they come over. They're like, I expected you to have like black walls everywhere. And I've lived in apartments where I have, I lived in, in financial district in New York downtown and my entire apartment was completely black, but I was also in a corner unit with floor to ceiling windows to where, you know, if it wasn't a black wall, it was windows. Um, and then all the furniture in my apartment was very light. Like I had a, an ivory sofa and light rugs. So if I'm going to do white walls, I do darker furniture. And if I'm going to do dark walls, I do lighter furniture. Because if you do everything dark, you know, one of the reasons why I do dark walls is most people think that dark walls make spaces look smaller, but they actually make spaces look bigger. Um, huh. Doing a dark ceiling will make it look bigger because the ceiling then kind of disappears mentally. Like it feels just like the ceiling goes on forever. Like it's just lost in space. Um, the same is with a dark wall. A dark wall actually creates depth. Um, but if your furniture is dark and your wall is dark, there's no depth. So it then makes it feel smaller. So if you're going to do a dark wall, it'll make your space feel larger, but make sure that your furniture, your rugs, your accessories are light because it's creating a contrast between the wall and the furniture and creating that depth. Um, if everything is the same color, there's no depth. Even if everything is all white, there's not that much depth, you know, which is why I like using darker pieces when I'm, when I leave my walls white. That's a great one. I didn't, uh, I'm learning so much here. This is great for me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what is your favorite place to shop for decor? Uh, chain retail, mom and pop shops or both? Um, chain retail, you know, I hate that word chain retail, Target. Target has the, <coughs> the, best home stuff hmm. um and not just in their stores like they have a really great selection in their stores but online they carry way more stuff online than they do in stores um their home stuff is kind of dependent on location like some of their locations have way more home stuff than others they just base it on sales and the demand for things um but they have really great inexpensive home stuff we um do a lot of product roundups on bobbyburke.com a lot. And there's tons of stuff that we include from Target. Um, a little bit on the higher end price, uh, Lulu and Georgia, uh, they're an online website. Everything they do, I just love. Their aesthetic is so visually pleasing. Um, they, they have some color, but they do a lot of neutrals and they do a lot of great texture and prints. Um, so yeah, Lulu and Georgia, Target, um and i like a lot of vintage stuff as well like this piece behind me um is an old vintage piece hmm. yeah. yeah where'd you get that uh some something here in la i forget the name of it it's been a while yeah. i see a plan over there in the corner too exactly <laughs> i mean it's got a maintenance plan 
I've got my nice, beautiful orchids. Ooh, gotta show I me love. Now. Orchids are my thing. Like I can usually keep orchids blooming year round. Wow. Yeah, I, I, it makes me so sad when I see people get orchids and the moment they stop blooming, they just throw them away and they get another one. I'm like, no, the baby will bloom again. You don't need to throw it away. Uh, they're actually quite easy to get to bloom. Once I figured out the tricks, I, I keep the, I've had the same orchids for years. Wow. What's, what are the tricks? They have little, I don't know if you can see, see these like little nodules. Uh huh. So underneath almost every nodule is a potential branch. And what I found is if you peel that skin off of the nodule and expose that little nub that's trying to come out, it'll then come out and it'll oh. just keep growing more branches and every branch will create blooms. So I just make sure that I'm maintaining those little nodules and I mist them every day and I water them well once a week. And orchids do need a lot of sun. Like if you don't have a place, like right now you can't see, but it, the, my office is all glass on the front and it overlooks the hills and it's a lot of sun in the morning. Um, if, you, if they don't get a lot of sun, they won't, they won't do well. They do need good sun. Yeah. Good. Free orchid advice too. Man of many <laughs> talents here. Um, all right, we have a, a, our first sort of COVID specific question. Okay. Um, with COVID changing how we gather as a community, how do you think this will impact future design in public spaces? Could it change design in the home as well? It's a big question. Um, <clears throat> I think public spaces, design-wise, I definitely think, especially commercial, um, hospitality, um, if, you know, infrastructure like airports and stuff, I think, hopefully, designers will think of social distancing when designing, um, you know, because I, I sadly don't think this is going to be the last situation like this, you know, with our climate changing, you know, more and more viruses are, we're getting exposed to it, you know, we have permafrost in Siberia that's thawing out every day and animals that have been frozen for centuries are thawing out and we're, sadly, we're going to be exposed to more things like this, but we just need to be prepared and it won't have the effect on us that this has had. Um, you know, and not just as our governments need to be a little more prepared, but, you know, we as, we as a species and with design, and we need to be thinking about the ways that we set, you know, public spaces up to where people can naturally think about social distancing. You know, if it's a queue area, you know, maybe markers that are on the floor that aren't those big signs of six feet, you know, stuck on the floor, but just nice, tasteful markers that when you see it, you think about, oh, this is a safe distance to space myself from somebody. Um, so I think it will affect the way we design. I hope it does. You know, I, I find that designers who don't design socially responsible, I don't think should be designing. Um, I think a lot of designers just design for, to make a space pretty and it drives me nuts. You know, I think that spaces need to be functional as well. And I think that social distancing is going to be a part of our function for the foreseeable future. Um, so I think it is important for designers to start thinking about ways that society can still come together and still communicate and be around each other, but in a safe way. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking. And at, at, at home, I, I don't necessarily know if it'll affect design at home, um, except for the fact of making people kind of think about design at home more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people taking the time to, to make their spaces, you know, in the home industry, we call fall time nesting. And that's usually when we sell the most, when I had stores, the most home stuff, because people, especially when I had my stores in New York, like come fall, like I don't want to go outside. You can't go outside. It's disgusting. It's nasty. It's cold. You know, you're no longer off on holiday in the summer. You come home and you spend a lot of time at home. So you start nesting and you start thinking about, oh, you know, I need a piece of art or oh, I need a rug. I need a blanket. Um, I think that we're, you know, we're having to start nesting year round right now. So in that sense, I think it will have an effect on home because I think we're starting to realize that our home does have an effect on our mental health. And in order for us to stay sane in our home, we need it to you know, fully charge us. The public spaces thing is really interesting too. I mean, just being in New York, it's like you know, so much of the design here is, well, I don't know if it's the design's fault, but it's how, how many people can we get into one space, right? And yeah. to think about redoing that is sort of, it's, to imagine that's a, it's a radical overhaul. 
Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's going to be something that people are really going to go in and retrofit. You know, yeah. I just, especially you know, with everything that's done to the economy, I don't think that's in the cards. But hopefully, you know, people that are, you know, companies that are building new buildings, they're they're thinking about, all right, if this does happen, how can we make sure that the way we design the space is is going to make it operationally you know, the most useful if this happens again, how can we make sure that we protect our people, you know, and especially if that's in like workspaces that are open workspaces, um, you know, those big open rooms where everyone sits, you know, a foot away from each other and it's just one big long open table. I think that might be a thing of the past, you know, and I think that might be good in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think that that whole open workspace that started, God, probably in what, the early 2000s, um, really took off. And I think people have realized it's not maybe the best way for people to be productive. Um, it's also now not the safest. Um, I think flu season, you know, might eventually stop being as harsh if we stop putting each other right on top. You know, if we're, if we are designing those communal workspaces, we're thinking about, you know, putting up some glass, you know, putting up better dividers in between the spaces to where we're not constantly getting each other sick, you know, COVID-19 or not, we're, oh, people don't cover their mouths when they cough, it drives me nuts. Like, I will call them out, I'll be walking down the street and somebody's like, man, and I'm like, were you raised in a barn? Like, and this was even before the pandemic. Like, it's just, it's so socially irresponsible. So I think as designers, and as corporations, we need to start thinking about ways to protect our employees. You know, our employees, I think of my people as my single most valuable asset in my company. And before there was even a stop work order here, I was like, everybody work from home. And, you know, we're even a small office, you know, we're a little family. You know, it's not like we have hundreds of people in the building that could have possibly gotten us sick, but I'm like, stay at home. You know, I want to protect them. So if that means spending a little extra money and making that open workspace a little bit more protective, you know, spending a little extra money putting in a better air filtration system when you're when you're remodeling your company. So yeah, I think it will have an effect. Hopefully, you know, hopefully people will think about the fact that all right, you know, this might affect my bottom line now, but whew, COVID nineteen affected it a hell of a lot more. So I need to make sure that I'm building out a workspace that is more protective of my employees. So if we do have another pandemic, we don't all have to work from home. We we've taken the precautions and the steps to make sure that our workspace is safe enough for our people to be able to come to work, but still be safe. Yeah, and to your point about productivity, I think it's just, there might be some really interesting byproducts to reimagining how we design workplaces. Like I don't, okay. you know, I don't know that an open office plan is necessarily the best environment to foster creativity, right? Or these other yeah. things that may not even be directly related to pandemics, but could, could benefit as well from sort of an overhaul. So that'd be interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I saw a restaurant in Amsterdam who has, um, they had outdoor space for eating and they've built these little greenhouses to put around each table and wow. they're like we're following social distancing you know our our patrons are not having to be on top of each other at all and I'm like that's even in the workspace you know we'd hate to be in a little glass box but it kind of makes sense you know you can still see each other you can still communicate with each other but you don't have the possibility of getting each other sick you know obviously it, it can still happen a little bit but you know, just corporations and companies thinking of ways to protect their most valuable asset, which is people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen to that. Um, the next question is from Joy. She asks, uh, my partner collects screen printed posters. I prefer a variety of shapes, sizes, textures of art for interest. Any idea how to connect the two? Um, <laughs> I would say, find your favorite ones of him or hers, um, and then find art that coordinates with those. Um, you know, whether that be connecting it via color scheme or genre or texture, you know, if it's, for example, if he loves Star Wars, you know, posters, like I do, you know, finding a cool piece of, you know, a star, Stargazer. I'm more of a Star Trek person than a Star Wars, you know, what are those little shippy things? Um, you know, <laughs> cool, you know, what piece of art of one, you know, so things that coordinate with those posters, but aren't necessarily posters, because I agree that I don't even know, I actually, you didn't say this, but I feel that a room of all posters, it's too much. You know, anytime you have a room that's all one thing, to me, that's too much. 
Um, but finding, you know, those ones that are his favorite and building the art that you love based on that, I think is a really great way that you can both have pieces that you love, um, but that still feel cohesive. Yeah, so if it's an old, if it's, uh, you know, space balls, I don't know why I keep going to sci-fi, that's my favorite. Um, if it's a dirty dancing poster, you know, <laughs> Pick, pick a color from Swayze's outfit and, you know, find some art that coordinates with that. Yeah. Just for the record, though, Star Trek over Star Wars. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question. On a budget, what should I prioritize when remodeling my house? Um, remodeling or redecorating? Question says remodeling. All right, so for me, remodeling is like construction. Um, I would always prioritize kitchen and bathrooms because um, kitchen and bathrooms, you're gonna spend the most money there, but you're also gonna get that money back in your investment. And mm -hmm. also those are the spaces you actually probably spend the most time in it. If not the most time, those are the spaces you spend the most time where you're doing something where its functionality can frustrate and piss you off. You know, if your bathroom, if it is, does not have the right storage, if it does not have, you know, anywhere to put stuff in the shower, like those are the moments that piss you off and whether you realize it or not, put you in a bad mood that morning that will translate throughout your entire day. And also at night when you're at home, you know, trying to get ready for bed, puts you in a mood before bed that you may not even realize, oh, the sh crap falling off the shelf just made me not be able to sleep well. Um, the same with the kitchen. When you're trying to get, you know, meals ready for your family and stuff is falling out of cabinets and there's nowhere to put anything and you don't have the right counter space, you may not even think about the fact that that's putting you in a mood that's going to affect the way you interact with your family. Um, so prioritizing the two rooms that can have the most effect on your mental health and the rest of your day is your bathroom and your kitchen. Um, and again, also the spaces that you'll get the most bang for your buck. And with kitchen remodels, don't always think about having to do everything. Um, you'll notice on Queer Eye, I paint a lot of kitchen cabinets. It's because A, I don't have the budget to give them new ones. Um, I don't have the time to give them new ones. Um, putting a fresh coat of paint on ugly wood cabinets can make a kitchen look like a completely different mm -hmm. kitchen. Um, there was the Rob Elrod episode. He had lost his wife to cancer. He had two beautiful little boys. It was the be nice to your brother episode. Um, he, had, he was moving into a new house that just had these awful 90s kitchen cabinets and this horribly ugly kitchen counter. I repainted the cabinets and made it put a new backsplash up. Barely cost me anything. Kept the same kitchen counter and the kitchen counter looked brand new and looked amazing because I picked the right color for it. Um, so you can redo your kitchen on a budget make it feel like a completely new kitchen without, you know, spending tens of thousands of dollars on cabinets. Um, if you do need new cabinets, like I just redid my parents' home, Ikea has amazing cabinets. A lot of people think of, oh, they may not be, you know, that great of cabinets. I think they have like a 10 year warranty on them. Um, they really are great cabinets and you can get them off the cheap. So if you're thinking about doing new cabinets, there's no need to spend money on like super expensive Italian or custom made cabinets. You can get great pre-made cabinets from places like Ikea. How would, how would you change that answer if it was redecorating instead of remodeling? What should you prioritize with redecorating? Um, I would say, again, the spaces that have the most effect on you. Um, just, they said on a budget, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, paint. Paint is a really great way to make a room com feel completely new. Even if honestly, it's taking a, painting a white wall white again, you know, if that wall, especially if you're in an apartment and it's, you know, I know a lot of times in New York, I move into apartments and landlords don't give up. They don't even repaint, they don't clean, you know, you're, you're seeing like kind of the dirt around the light switch from the people that lived there before you just repainting that or getting some magic erasers and cleaning the walls will make that space feel fresh and new and make you not feel like you're living in someone else's grind. The first thing I did when I would move into New York apartments is I'd always scrub them down and landlords would come and be like, oh, did you put a new stove in? I'm like, no, asshole, I just cleaned it, which you should have done before I moved in. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I would say paint is a really great inexpensive way to start 
and rugs. Um, rugs don't have to be expensive. There are so many amazing printed rug options now um, that are, you can get for so cheap. You know, you can get a nice big rug for like 20 bucks sometimes because they're not woven, they're painted, or not painted, printed. Um, and the technology has gotten really good so they don't look awful anymore like they used to. Even if you have a carpeted apartment, get a rug. Cover up that ugly carpet that, you know, everyone else has lived on. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk. Like, it just I feel like a through line to this whole thing has been like the ways design sort of uh, exerts an influence on your energy, right? Like even yeah. back to you were talking about wearing a black shirt every day. It's just like designing your environment in such a way that it's not zapping you of energy you could use to work or you know be with your loved ones and, and expend energy in relationships. That's just like a. It's just that that's been the thing that's been sticking in my head. It's really interesting to hear you talk about. I'm glad I got through. <laughs> what are the um, top three books you recommend for learning basic design principles? You know, honestly, I have no answer for that. Um, I've never used a book to learn design. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not trained in design. I dropped out of high school at 15 when I left home. Um, I've always been self-taught. Um, honestly, YouTube is like the best like where I when I had to learn like design design like figuring out floor plans and stuff like that I watched a lot of YouTube videos I mean I'm sure there's a lot of great books out there but especially if you're trying to do it on the cheap like books especially educational books can be very expensive design books so I honestly just recommend online there's so many great designers out there that do online tutorials um, I'm getting ready to start an online design course um, for YouTube and for my site for people to come on and learn. So soon, bobbyburke.com. Uh, right now, just, you know, uh, Kelly Wurstler is doing a great masterclass right now in design. Um, I know it's, I think it's a little expensive, but um, again, you can find so many free YouTube videos out there on great design that will give you really good ideas. You know, again, there's so many designers out there that are trying to break out in the entertainment world. So they do a lot of great online content. No. YouTube. It's the best design book out there. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the last question. Um, it is, how do you consider potential cultural appropriation issues when creating themed designs? Um, I am not a big fan of theme designs, period. Um, it's just not my thing. Uh, you know, I, I do like bringing some cultural elements into it. I don't, I don't know, it's, it's a touchy subject. Like I, I usually won't bring a cultural element into a space unless it has something personally to do with the person I'm designing for. Like any, anything that I'm putting into someone's space for me needs to have a personal attachment. If you'll notice on Queer Eye, much of the art has a meaning. You know, if you look at AJ's episode, which he was a gentleman who came out to his stepmom in season one, there was a Miami airport code art in his bedroom. And he walked in and he saw that. He's like, oh my God, that's so crazy that you put that. He's like, that was the very first place my boyfriend and I went on vacation together. And I'm like, yeah, I know. You told me that. And that's exactly why that piece of art is up there. You know, so, you know, if, you know, for example, if the, the person I'm designing for has a Native American background, like that's part of their, their family in the background, I'll probably pull some Native American elements in there. You know, it's probably not something I would pull into someone else's home just because it, it doesn't have personal meaning to them. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to stay away from what you would say as cultural appropriation because I just, I wouldn't put something in someone's home that has nothing to do with them. Mm. You know, um, if it's something that they've found on their travels, you know, to me, it, it has a personal, a personal attachment to them. So it's, if it's something of theirs that they feel passionate about in their home, I'm, I'm going to use it unless it's, you know, an art from another country that's clearly been stolen from a museum or something and that's not going to happen um but yeah you know if it if it has something personal to do with the fam the person you know especially family heritage I'll, I'll always try to incorporate that but as far as just like doing themes no that's that's not me yeah it makes me uncomfortable uh -huh. i even in season season three or four um we put a little teepee in, in a little girl's room and you know it's wasn't native american print or anything like at the time i didn't even think about it but somebody made a comment mm -hmm. about it a fan and i was like ah yeah like to me it's just it was a tent but 
yeah, now that I think about it, it, it is a TV and I probably won't be doing that anymore. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's it. An hour. Exactly. Um, nice. Anything else to, to add? Nah, just hang in there, everybody. You know, this will be over soon. The more we stick together and help each other out, you know, the quicker this will be over and the safer we'll be. So, Great. And we'll see everyone at South by Southwest next year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think that is uh, is a good place to end. I got to put these plants back where they belong, you know, in their happy respective <laughs> homes. Um, I don't know. It looks like they're getting a lot of good light. I think they might be happier. They now. are. They are. Uh, light is one thing I have to work with in here. I'm lucky. So, um, well, thank you, Bobby. This is great. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Course, uh, I'm going to kick it back to Miranda now, uh, unless, Bobby, you have anything uh, you would like to add. No, I'm good. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, guys.